Thank you all for introducing yourselves. That was wonderful. Yeah. And I know some of you did. And I was somehow was able to skip this, but I know who you are now we'll find you later. <laughs> Moving on. So uh, every civic tech we like to have a presenter, and we always start these things by reminding you all that this session is recorded and it will be posted on the YouTubes uh, for our 10 followers. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, but we do also encourage tweets and other photos. So, our speaker for today is Elon Baker, or MPB Baker. He is the parliamentary assistant to the Minister Responsible for Digital Government and to the Minister of Finance. So, MPB Baker will be presenting on how the Ontario government is driving appearance and openness in Ontario through some illustrative examples. So, take it away. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, so it's a real thrill to be here with all of you. Um, as I said, this is not my first time. I had, a, had the opportunity to participate, as Gabe would know, in a number of hackathons and over the last uh, couple of years or so. And um, I didn't say this when I was introducing myself, but um, one of the reasons I'm here, besides the fact that I was asked to be your speaker, is I think what you guys are doing is really cool. And it may not be the reason I'm here tonight specifically, but it's the reason that I've been with you a number of times before. So, really admire what you guys do, and uh, really want to do as much as I can to support. I think what you're doing is really cool, but I think what you're also doing is um, making a difference. And uh, that's really what I want to talk to you about today, is how we're making a difference, and how government's using some innovative tools to do this back. Uh, before I do, I do want to say a big thank you to the organizers. Um, thank you very much for all your work. Cody, I do want to learn about how you figured out how do you got the extra OPP officers. <laughs> I have, I've been trying to get the extra OPP officers for a long time. So there are requirements. There are requirements. Yeah, maybe I, maybe I have to chat. Um, they just took one look at it, and that was it. That was it. Yeah. Okay, I'm my own security. That's cool. Um, so just before I get into the content, I. Uh, I want to share with you a story uh, about a conversation I had with one of my MPP colleagues just a few days before I attended my first hackathon. So we're sitting in the legislature in the chamber, and um, those of you who observe what happens in the legislature uh, will know that during debates, um, when we're not intently paying attention to what the opposition is telling us, then we're sometimes chatting with each other on, off the side. And um, and I was chatting with uh, with one of my colleagues who who I won't name. One of my people call it. And he was saying, you know, what are you up to this, this weekend? And I said, oh, I told him a little bit about the events I had in Tobacco. And I said, but I'm going to this thing called a hackathon. And he said, what's a hackathon? I said, well, basically what happens is, you know, people come, they present a whole bunch of problems. And these folks come out on a Saturday. They spend the entire day working on the problems, and they come up with solutions. And we give them data, the other other information to help them solve the problem. And he says, so we have, we give them a problem and they come up with a solution for us. And I said, yeah, that's right. And he said, and they do that for free? <laughs> said, yeah. And he says, well, he says, well, it sounds to me like they're gonna put us out of a job, right? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know about that, if they're gonna put us out of a job, but they're definitely gonna make Ontario better. Right? They're going to help us all be better as government, as legislators, as people who care about making our communities and our problems better. So I want to thank you for doing that every time you come to these events, every time you try to tackle these problems. That's what gets me excited about what you do and about supporting what you folks do and, um, and why I'm here today. So we talked. I talked about how um, we're all here making a difference. I ran, I used to be in business, um, I used to be a management consultant. So I used to get paid by companies. Um, the company I work for was called, is called the Boston Consulting Group. And I get hired by large companies along with a team of other people like me. And we'd solve business problems for, for clients. Really complex things that they didn't know how to solve themselves. Kind of like what you're helping us to do here in a different context and different way. So I left a, a career that was going well um, to run for office. Um, and sometimes my, my old business colleagues, after I ran, after I quit the firm and started, you know, canvassing and knocking on doors, said to me, well, why are you, why did you choose to leave business to run for office? Like, some of them think I've made a questionable choice. And I said to them, well, it's because I get to make a difference for people. 
right? So what I want to talk to you about is a few stories. I want to share with you three stories about how we're making a difference, um, how we're making life more fair, um, and how we're doing that by being more open and transparent government. And so I want to talk to you about student aid. I'm going to talk to you about how we are using evidence to drive change. And I'm going to talk to you how, um, and this is the part that excites me the most, um, about how we're trying to um, co-create our future. And I help with, by working with folks like yourself. Okay. Um, so let me just talk quickly about student aid. How many of you have heard about the changes to student aid? All right, that's a pretty good number. Okay. So, um, so just as a, as a brief, brief background, so education is obviously fundamental. It's a critical element of what we do with the government of Ontario. Um, but post-secondary education is becoming increasingly critical. So if we think about the economy that people, the labor market, we think about the economy and what's fundamental to success in the labor market, then um, post-secondary education is increasingly important, right? So about 70% of jobs out there in Ontario now require a post-secondary degree. Like that wasn't even the case. That certainly wasn't the case when I graduated from my undergrad. And it certainly was the case during the previous generation. So that's a big change. Um, and so it's a key driver not only to quality of life, but to our prosperity. Um, and it's been a long-standing principle, and I subscribe to this principle, that, um, that if you're hardworking and you're qualified and you want to pursue post-secondary education, money shouldn't stand in the way. Right? Like, your ability to get into post-secondary should be based on your ability to learn, not your ability to pay, basically. Um, and we all know what the return on investment that that brings. And so over the years, the government of Ontario, the federal government also funds this, has provided a whole myriad of student aid programs. How many of you had OSAP when you went to university or college? <coughs> yeah, so most of you, right? Um, and so, and well, you know, this happens sometimes in government where people think about, are constantly thinking about how can we improve the current student aid system or other system, and so we keep adding things to that package of supports. And over time, the system became complicated, right? And so we had tax credits, we had loans, we had various sorts of grants, universities and colleges provide various forms of student aid, and it got really complicated and actually really confusing. Um, but it also became very inefficient and bureaucratic. So, um, and the problem with inefficiency and bureaucracy uh, when it comes to a customer-facing or citizen-facing service is that it dissuades people from using it, right? So, um, and this is what we were hearing from people, from families, and that it was hard for them to figure out what student aid was available for, right? Whether it be for the prospective student or for the, the families who are guiding, right? Or guiding counselors or whatever the case may be. Um, so what, what government did, what we did, and I was one of the people who was fortunate to be part of these discussions, um, was um, what are we actually trying to achieve with student aid? Like why do we offer student aid? Um, what outcomes matter to us in you Ontario? Know, Is there a way to work smarter to do more of what matters, like deliver more and better outcomes with the same amount of money, right? Because we can always spend more money, right? And take away from other programs and services that are also important, right? That's always a risk when you think about improving something. Can we take the existing pot of money and, and improve uh, and, and make it better? Um, and so, um, and like I said, you won't want, we didn't want income to be the make it or break it factor. So once we decided, well, we want students who are able to learn to get access, we don't want money to be a factor, um, we, that was the block of student aid. And then we needed to determine how we were going to do that. And so we modernized and simplified the system, and we consolidated grants, we eliminated the tax credit, um, and we took, this is the part that I think was cool, maybe because I was part of it, unbiased, but we, were, we took a sort of a digital first approach, right? So the key step was creating a website um, that made it clear to students and families what was available, how much they were eligible for, and how would it shift their financial, uh, how would it shift their financial uh, picture going forward as they move forward. And I, so I'm the parliamentary assistant to Minister Matthews, who's the Minister for Digital Government. And what was really cool, one of the coolest things I've got in the government, was sit with Minister Matthews, and we had these, I think I'm allowed to share this with you, I'm going to share it now. Um, should have with her first. But anyway, we, we, we had these, weekly meetings where um, the team that was working on this digital platform on this website would come together and say, here's a, here's a draft, an iteration of what this could look like. Right? And Minister Matthews and her team, and I had the privilege of being in that room, um, would provide feedback and ask questions. And how can we make this better? What about the students who look at it from this perspective? You know, Everything from, you know, is the information clear and the information that students need there to, um, 
to you know, are we is the is are we creating the, is the design uh, done in such a way that students will engage with it, and want to participate on it, right? Everything else, anything anything you can think of. But we really want to make sure that this was a digital first approach, that this was really something that students or prospective students would want to interact with, which was really cool. Um, and um, and so if you're interested in what I'm talking about, many of you have probably seen the website, but Ontario.ca slash OSAP is the site I'm talking about. Um, and and so that's it's just very, very cool. And from what I hear from Minister Matthews and her team, um, the subscription rates are awesome, like off the charts for student aid compared to past years. I think that's really, really exciting. So that speaks to obviously the quality of the program, the underlying benefits, and everything else that's part of the OSAP, but it's also a website, which is really cool. So that's a digital first approach. Um, and so, so again, by focusing on outcomes, by, by identifying what we wanted to achieve, by thinking cleverly how we would do that, how we would deliver that, um, we can do a better outcome. So we have a digital first approach, the website, I think is pretty, pretty cool as well. But and what we did ultimately with the program is we eliminated the tax credits, we took the money that people get for those tax credits and we put it into grants. So basically, this is a program that's geared to income, right? If you make $50,000 or less, or your family makes $50,000 or less as a student, uh, the average tuition is going to be covered by the grants. The average tuition will be free, right? That's pretty cool, right? Think about how many students. That's two, over 200,000 students will have free tuition this year. 200,000 students get it free. That doesn't include, there are a lot of students who aren't, aren't part of that 200,000 who will get a lot of support, whose, whose tuition will be largely covered or mostly covered. But that's a pretty big deal. Uh, and so getting rid of that barrier, that's changing lives, right? Because people who wouldn't have otherwise gone to university or college are now going to university and college, right? And those people who could have gone are now able to take that money and put it towards other things, like their family, uh, like saving for books or computers or whatever else, housing. I mean, it's really going to change people's ability and people's quality of life as well and their prospective future. So that's one story. The second story was um, starts with something very different. And I talked to you about a firefighter in Thunder Bay named Dale Shipman. And a number of years ago, uh, Dale uh, found his life in danger. And this was not because of uh, he contracted a virus, which damaged his car. So eventually, um, luckily, another Ontarian had signed uh, a, uh, an Oregon donor form. How many of you signed an Oregon donor form? Okay, most of you. Good for you. That's great. Okay. Um, and so they also got in the car. And in a little, in a little over a year, um, he was back serving his community, fighting fire in that day. Um, Organ transplants are awesome, right? And they change lives. Now, that notwithstanding, um, Ontario had historically had relatively low um, rates of organ donor consent, right? So I was actually really impressed that the number of hands just went up. But if you go into my community, when I talk to people about what percentage have signed up for their organ donor cards, it's not it's not half the people, it's less than half the people. So this is this is great, um, but it's not representative of what's happening more broadly, what's been happening. Um, but people are willing to donate, they just don't sign a card, right? And so we need to address that issue. So, um, so we knew that we had the data to say, look, our sign-up rate is low, so people's subscription rate is low, um, but we also had research that said people were willing to donate, to donate their organs. Um, and so we need to figure out um, if there was a simple way to close that gap. How do we get those people who are willing to do what's necessary so that when we need that heart, when we need that kidney, um, so there's a small unit of researchers in government called the Behavioral Insights Unit. Some people call it the Nudge Unit. I think Nudge is a much cooler name. And um, and uh, we found that they were founded in 2015, and we turned to help uh, turned to them for help. And the idea uh, of a nudge is that it's not a big campaign to try to persuade people, right? Like your first inclination might be, let's put a bunch of ads on TV, let's talk about the importance of organ donation, and government has done that before, right? And that works too. Um, and there's a place for that kind of initiative, but if you think about the ads you've seen recently, right, like ads reminding you not to text and drive, maybe, or not to drink and drive, those kinds of ads, those kinds of, if you want to do that behavior, campaigns like that work. But for this, we need something different. So the behavioral insights unit, the nudge unit, um, they tried some experiment, and um, they looked at some evidence as to how people react and respond to different forms. So we ran a pilot test, which used to look at the layout of the organ donor form, uh, we compare the uptake rates for that, new forms of the ones we're getting, etc. We iterated on this. Um, and can we make, the goal was to, to make this form work a little bit better so that people would notice the donor option and actually sign up. 
um, part of the problem as well. Sorry. And so this is something that the tech community does all the time, right? An iterative approach to see if you can change behavior just by doing something right or making that critical button more obvious. Kind of like what Minister Matthews and I were trying to do when we were doing you know, the those half of stuff, right? Um, and so we learned from you guys, and we knew the behavior of us, you know, knew the government can learn that way too. So in our, just to give you some data, in our case, during our pilot test, our organ, our donor registration rates went up when we made these changes by 143%, just by these, making these design changes. Um, that's more than double the old rate. Um, so, and if you remember, every, every organ donor has the potential to benefit up to 75 other people. 75 people for every person potentially, for every person who signs up, right? So, thanks to this pilot test, we have a change that we hold up throughout the system. It won't cost taxpayers anything, right? Um, and it'll make the difference between life and death for thousands of Ontarians, like Dale, the firefighter I told you about. Um, and so, this is an example of how we're working smarter to achieve better results. And, um, and I think it's particularly cool as a business guy, because as a business guy, I know what business people do, right? Business people are constantly looking at, when they're in the private sector, the bottom line, how can they do more with less or more with the existing? And this is another example, good example of that. So the last story I want to talk, tell you about is about co-creation. Um, and this is the part I get most excited about, right? So um, as I look out at all of you, I see a bunch of people who want to make a difference, make, want to make society better, right? Um, and who are willing to step up and dedicate your time to making that happen. Um, and a group that meets every week, most people meet every week. Am I right? Yeah, a lot of people every week. Figure out how they can make our communities better and stronger. So, um, and so, one of the things that we've realized is that open government is, having an open government, transparent government, is fundamental to equipping people like you guys with the tools you need to make us better. Right? As my MPP colleague said, put us out of a job. Right? That's the goal. So, um, so to this end, we've updated our uh, consultation directory to better communicate when we are doing consultations and report back on what we hear. Um, we've released data sets and directed and engaged in co-creation with folks like you. And as a result of this work led by Treasury Board's Open Government Team, uh, our government won the Open Data Summit Award for Open Data. Excellent. Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah. So, quick example. So, recently, Minister Dugan, he's a Minister of Economic Development and Growth, um, led another round of consultations on what we call the Red Tape Challenge, right? So, how do, it's basically asking businesses to figure out how we eliminate unnecessary regulation, right? Because business people, as a business person, I know this to be true, right? Regulation is a cost of business, and it sometimes makes it difficult to compete, right? So, um, and so we've been consulting sec uh, sector by sector with an eye to removing barriers to business. And um, currently we're consulting with the chemical manufacturing sec sector, and then we're planning to work with forestry sectors, tourism sectors in the near future. But um, the best co-creation, well, not the best, I'm going to tell you another one. The one of the best co-creation projects is, um, is our annual budget talks process. So, how many of you know what budget talks is? Okay. Okay, so, so more people have signed a donor or a donation card than for a budget talks. We're going we're gonna to fix it. So, um, the organization stuff is great, but this is also great. I want you to know this. So, um, budget talks. So, so, for the past two years, we've actually asked people across Ontario to come up with ideas and submit them and vote on ideas that would then be funded through the provincial budget. Right? So, up until now, right, what would happen? MPPs would hear from people in their communities. People, the good staff that work for ministers might hear from stakeholders, ministers would hear from various stakeholders, and then, you know, the Minister of Finance is responsible for kind of putting that together in a big document, coming, all, coming up with, with our spending priorities. But, but what's cool about this is basically increasingly, and the budget talks is growing every year, we're increasingly relying more and more on input through this digital channel, through budget talks. Um, and so basically, I mean, it's a website, and we had it last year, we had the year before, we'll have it again this year that basically allows people to submit ideas, people can comment on the ideas, so they can refine the idea, and then people vote on them. And the top three ideas, well, last year the top three ideas got funded. Um, we'll see what happens this year. But um, real money, like millions of dollars, get committed to these ideas. And that's one way in which we're listening. So we got a lot of interesting input through that channel. We actually implement the things that we're hearing. So that's a, that's a great example of co-creation, where a lot of people are combining their efforts and their thoughts to, um, deliver, to deliver a great outcome. And we'll be launching budget talks again this year. And, um, and I'm going to make sure we're going to make sure that um, 
We have someone highlighted this in Civic Tech Toronto's uh, Slack channel when it goes live, for those of you are interested. Um, and it'll be great to have you folks participate and see what ideas it generates. Um, the last thing I want to say, and you know what happened to you, a politician on Mike? Um, <laughs> inevitably, inevitably has to talk about one of his pet projects. Um, and so I'm going to take a couple minutes uh, just to tell you about another one. This is all into this co creation idea, and partly why I'm so excited about co creation. So, um, when I, one of the things that I struggled with when I graduated, I graduated from a business degree in New York, okay? And after I graduated, I struggled to find a job, right? And then there was another phase in my career where I also struggled to find a job. Now, when I went to university, I had this vision that I'm going to a good school, I'm getting good grades, I'm going to be successful, right? But this is a foregone conclusion, right? But it didn't work out that way. And as it turns out, it didn't work out that way for me, but it doesn't work out that way for a lot of people, right? And so, one of the things that I discovered was, in, since being elected also, is that a lot of young people face the same challenge, right? And a lot of them said to me, you know, if I had known today what I knew, if I had known when I, when I applied what I know to a university or college, what I'd known today, I might have, might have studied something different, right? I might have taken a different program, I might have gone to a different institution, I might have gone to a different major, right? Um, for example. And one of the, so if we, if, if we want people to succeed in, in achieve their dreams, we want to make sure that they make an informed decision about where they go to school, right? Where they go to post-secondary, and what program they study at post-secondary. So um, one of the things that, that I've been an advocate of, and I have a private member's bill on this, um, is on a, a private member's bill I took a couple years ago, that would require the government to create a website, kind of like the OSAP website we were just talking about, right? Which would provide students with information about every college and university program in Ontario. And so if a student was thinking about applying to want to be, I don't know, an engineer, and they looked up U of T engineer, I'm making this up, hypothetical example, they could get some interesting information about that program. Things like how much does it cost, what grant, what 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 uh, what grade you need to get in, things like that, um, what student aid is available. They learn some things about the experience, right? How do current students rate that experience? How do graduates of engineering and then they get some information about what do people who graduate from U of T engineering do after they graduate? Are they actually in engineering? Now, it actually happens that people who graduate from engineering actually are become engineers. But, <laughs> but if a large number of them aren't pursuing engineering, that might be an issue for somebody who wanted to be an engineer, right? Like if you found out that a lot of large percentage of folks graduating from engineering were actually working in retail or in unrelated fields, you might say, I should check out some of the other options, right? Some of the other engineering degrees out there. Anyway, to me, the decision you make about university or college is one of the most important decisions you make in, in your life. Right? It's pivotal. And think about, to me, it's up there with like getting married and buying your first house. Well, think about how much time you spend on those two decisions. Right? Like, I bought my first house, I spend a lot of time. I'm not married, but I know that when, before I do, you know, I'll spend some time. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so, to me, when you make a decision about which your college degree you're going to study, you should, you should have the information to make an informed decision. It's pivotal, right? To your prosperity, to your happiness, to achieving your dreams. So that's been so I introduced the private members bill on this, and Minister Matthews has took an interest in this. And um, and so uh, you know, we're gonna be doing something very soon, and I'm kind of scooping my own announcement here, but I'm gonna share it with you anyway. Um, is it fits in this co-creation thing, and I'm kind of excited about it. I'm really excited about it. Um, so, like I said, it's choosing a pathway after high school is a pivotal moment, and so it's critical to have tools and resources so that students can make, have the information they need to make that informed choice, right? On personal growth, learning, and success, we have, without the influences of you know, the, the biases of maybe traditional media, that sort of thing. And so we want to know, we want to know this, how can we design a digital tool or resource? that uses open data to help students make more informed decisions about their available post-secondary pathways. That's what we want to figure out. So how do we design a digital tool or resource that uses open data to help students make more informed decisions about their post-secondary pathways? So we're going to have a six-week design competition. Okay? Um, teams will work to answer this question by building a digital solution um, to help students navigate these pathways in their futures. And the top 10 teams will travel to Toronto, have a chance to pitch their ideas and present their prototypes to a panel of innovative and creative thinkers. 
And the teams with the most promising solutions will be awarded prizes, like monetary prizes, real money. Um, I won't tell you how much money. I'll save that for the answer. How does that sound? Okay, so stay tuned. But um, anyway, this is another this is another concrete example of how we're trying to use co-creation to uh, help people to make to help develop the policies, to help develop the programs, to help people um, live more prosperous lives. Um, so those are the three stories I wanted to share with you. I think I've seen it. I told you four. But um, these are all examples of how we're using evidence to make decisions, how we're using the digital first approach to make decisions, how we're leveraging your talents or talents of people like you to make uh, to make decisions and to find solutions. And uh, through that, we're making this, uh, this province a better place. And so I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you for contributing your time and your energies to those who get popular and others. And um, and uh, thank you. And I hope you have a good Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, moving on. And as you can see, uh, questions will be afterward, uh, afterwards, and you can just approach.